I'm uh, Bob Lenny. I was the first pastor here at Good Shepherd Lutheran Church, and I'm supposed to give you a little history of the starting of this congregation. So I'm what you call a dinosaur with my age. But before I, I really get into the history of Good Shepherd Lutheran Church, I want to give you a little history of the Lutheran Church in America. Now you were just taken a, talked about the Reformation, the birth of the church over in Europe. You see, the Lutheran Church, of which you and I are a member, was never organized, originated in the United States. We are a European church, so to speak. That's where our roots were. And as the end result, as the people came over to, to uh, uh, this country, they stayed in their national ethnic group. By that, I mean the Germans stuck together, the Danes were over here, the Swedes were here, the Finlanders were here, and, they, that's the way, and that's the way they organized their congregations. So we, were, we had more different Lutheran churches in small communities than Carter's had Liverpool. We taught basically the same thing, but we couldn't stand one another. For example, the, German, the Norwegians would have nothing to do with the Swedes. The Swedes didn't really have too much to do with the Finlanders. The Finlanders didn't do too much with the Danes. The Danes had nothing to do with the Germans, and the Germans couldn't get along with themselves. In result, you had different little synods, as we call, of churches. And they operated like Lone Rangers, never cooperated, and that was the history of our church. It was sad. And then we could sit, we could have, in our, in our communities, we'd have our churches in one corner, another corner, wouldn't worship together, but yet we would sing, you, you shall know us by our love as our love, as we thumbed our noses across our fellow Lutherans, across the, the, the street from us. Now, I may be add, you know, adding on to that, but that's the history. It's not a pretty history. Now, I was, I'm part Norwegian and I'm part Nor uh, German. I was baptized in with the Norwegian church. When I was confirmed your age, I was confirmed in the German church. The ALC was called at that time. So I was a Duke's mixture. And I went to to the college in Waverly, Iowa, called Wartburg College, and then went to Wartburg Seminary in Dubuque, Iowa. I graduated from the seminary 1957. Now, the churches were beginning to make some motion in, in getting together. And as I graduated, there was a movement where the Norwegians, the ELC Church, and the Germans, the ALC Church, we're going to, to merge together and formulate the ALC, the American Lutheran Church, in 1960. Well, I graduated in 57, three years ahead of that merger. And the interesting thing is that in our day, we graduated from the seminary, we never interviewed with a congregation for a call. They just sent you. Out of the SEM, they just sent you where they thought you would fit. And that was it. No arguing, no, de no debating, you went. So we were sent, or some of us thought we were sentenced. We couldn't make up our mind. But anyway, I was called to be a pastor at Mott, North Dakota. How many of you know where Mott is? How many have been there? It's down in the southwestern part of the state and uh, about 40 miles northeast of Hedinger, about 60 miles south of Dickinson. In Mott, North Dakota, there were two Lutheran churches. They were the German church on the southwest part of town. The northwest part of town was the Norwegian church and the Cannonball River ran between them like a moat and they never did get together. That's where I was. 
And I was told by my bishop, or the district president at that time, that you are responsible to try to get these two congregations together in one, as one worshiping unit, one church. Get them ready for 1960. And the only qualification I had for that is that I'm part German, part Norwegian. I didn't know diddly about how to go about this. I did not meet with any of the council members. I didn't know who they were. I was ordained in my home congregation in Jamestown. And, and, and there, two people from Mott came and went to the ordination service, and I met them. Those are the only two people I met. So I drive, the next day, I drive down to Mott to meet with two councils. And now I'm going to be their pastor. And we met in this nice room, and we were talking about the church and the mission of the church and that. But then they were coming close to close the meeting, and they said, well, pastor, do you have any comments to be made? I said, well, be that I'm going to be your pastor, I would like to have you council members, both councils, come together and be present as a group at my service of installation when I'm installed to be your pastor. Then things begin to happen. Now that's a simple request, don't you think? Just come to church. We wouldn't even take an offering. Okay. So one old timer came unglued. I didn't know who he was, but he walked, this is my first meeting, he walked across the, the, the room, he was shaking his finger at me, and he says, now listen, Sonny, all of a sudden, I'm a Sonny. Don't get the idea we're merging because we ain't even holding hands. You got that straight? That was my introduction to the parish ministry at that time. And I, just a young, young man, scared, spitless. Now what am I going to do? The bishop said they were ready. They, they weren't. So there was a miscommunication. And I had such feelings that if I could find the bishop, I'd hang him for setting me up in such a situation. I wanted to get out. I wanted to quit. I couldn't. Our furniture from the seminary in that school was already in, in transit coming out to Mott. So I began to serve there. It turned out to be a tremendous experience. 16 months later, now 16 months later, they merged into one church without a dissenting vote in either congregation. Worked out beautifully. It's tremendous. And I was having a good time. And I, 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 I was enjoying my ministry there. I, had, I was very comfortable, and I was doing what I loved. And okay, now, step two, I get a call from what they called the mission, District Mission Committee asking me to interview with them because they are going to be establishing a new church. These were the Germans now. A new church in Bismarck, North Dakota. Northwest Bismarck, North Dakota. You are sitting in that location today. You are to come, and they've entered, and they says, we would like to call you, and you will start this congregation from ground zero. And uh, I wasn't happy with, with, the, with the offer. I didn't, wasn't interested. And the reason I wasn't interested, I was scared. Because when I left the seminary, I vowed that I'd never, ever become a whole mission pastor where you started from ground zero. There's no way. And there was that gnawing voice. God never lets you rest. That gnawing voice saying, Lenny, if you're going to run away from this, when are you going to stop running away from challenges in your life? And so, with fear and trepidation, Looking to God for guidance, I accepted the call to come up here in October of 1960 to start this church. Now, October 1960, this merger that I was telling you about between the Norwegians and the Germans was taking place, and would it be official 
on January of 1961. So here I was, I came up here, they had purchased this land, there was no church building here, they had built the parsonage, in fact when we moved in they were just finished laying the carpeting, built the parsonage, and then they had built, a, were in the process of building a first unit, worship unit, we called it the chapel. Now, that building today is down on Capitol Street, uh, across some, some apartments, east of Hardy's. You'll see a gray building. Well, that was our first church. The parsonage that's been moved is South Mandan somewhere. But anyway, there I was, and, 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 and the district president comes and says to me, okay, this is your job. You go out and find members to join the church. And by the way, here's the debt. You will be responsible seeing that you, this, this uh, project gets paid. And at that time it was $100,000. I'd say in today's uh, way it would be close to a million dollar debt. So all I had could do, I took a notebook with me and I would, went down, I went down Meredith Drive started knocking at every door, you know, just knocking, asking people, telling them who I was, and saying, I'd like to know if you'd be interested in this mission, you know. That's, that's what I was asking them. Would you be willing to join? And I called for three weeks, from 8 o'clock or 8.30 in the morning till maybe 5, all around. And... Uh, after the, uh, the time, I got about 25 people who said they would be what, what would like to join, start a mission church, be a part of it. And so on a Thursday evening, we met in the parsonage, 20 people, to talk about this mission, how we're going to get it started, what are we going to do, what should we call ourselves as a congregation, and so forth. That night, they decided they wanted, at the suggestion of Mr. John Larson, that they would name this church Good Shepherd Lutheran Church. That's how it got started. Then they voted on about four or five of them who would be called a steering committee to work with me in organizing a ministry in this part of the community. Then they decided we will have our first worship service the first Sunday in November, 1960. Then they'd have Sunday school the second Sunday in November, and the way we would go. And the chapel, as we call it, was still under construction. I mean, they, were, they had it framed in and everything, but they had to get the interior fixed. So, but we're going to worship there anyway. So, Saturday afternoons, we, four, five, or six of us, would take some brooms, come on over to the chapel, and sweep out all the carpenter dust and sawdust and everything else, set up, we didn't have chairs, so we set up benches, planks across nail caves. That was the, those were the first pews and, and, uh, and the like. And these men, it was interesting. One was the Chief Justice of the State Supreme Court coming over, there's overhauls, and was sweeping out and, and, and we're sitting on uh, sheet rock looking out the window and wondering what's going to happen you know, over the years. But that that's was the beginning of the church. We had our first worship service and we had I want to say 85, 65 to 85 people were present and worshiped. And it went off pretty well. And interesting is that there they sat on these planks, and we had a piano, and we sang, and, 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 and it was just a good fellowship with one another. I'll never forget the first Christmas service we had. Still unfinished. Here was a light bulb of a drop cord down, which would give us some light. 
Christmas Eve, and we wanted to, Ben said, we want to have a Christmas tree for our Christmas service. They went out, it was a little late, so they went out and they found a Christmas tree, they put it up, I looked at it, and I just shook my head. It made Charlie Brown's Christmas tree look fantastic. It was the sickest tree I'd ever seen. It, it just had a trunk, a few branches. If you, put a, if you put a small string of light bulbs on it, it was over-decorated. It was the most anemic tree I've ever seen. But you know what? It was the most wonderful service with that humble beginning. Then, in January, the first Sunday in January, 1961, we organized officially as a congregation. People were coming, people were joining, and it was a full filled with excitement. And there we got organized, we called ourselves the first mission church to be organized in, the, in, in this ALC merger, in the history of it. But uh, now, we are organized and the, the ALC headquarters gave us a subsidy to help pay for our expenses. And it was to the tune of $25,000. What our offerings did not cover, they would help pay. You follow me? And after about five to 10 months, the council said, we don't want any more support because we can support ourselves as a, through our offerings. So we rejected their, we had about $15,000 left, we rejected, we don't need it anymore. What they did to us, they took $15,000 off the, 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 the cap, the, the debt, lowered it by $15,000. That's how they worked with us. And when we were, they, they, they had us uh, give us a loan, and it was like 1%. That's pretty cheap. And then as time went on, they said, could you go to your bank and refinance, give us our money back so we can help start another church? And I says, well, that's almost suicide. You're gonna have me give up a 1% interest loan, and at that time, maybe get a 5%. It's a heavy duty on us. And they did some figuring. They said, okay, we'll knock another, some, like $25,000, $30,000 off the, the, uh, the loan, and that should help you. That's how well they worked with us. And we were self-supporting in 10 months, and began to grow and serve. And that's the basically the brief history of this church. But now, in 1964, they said, we're starting to outgrow our building. We're going to have to build a new church, worship center. So in 64, they began doing that. And I, I forget the, the exact years. I think it's 67, they got into the new church. What was interesting about this is that these people that were on this committee said, if we're going to build a church, let's build it with a sense of purpose of what we're trying to accomplish. Let us make a statement of our faith and how we design the building. So a man by the name of, he's still a member <coughs> here, he comes, sits over there on 830 service. He was on the building committee and he did some research and he says, I think that we've got to go by a theme. Just don't build it, build it. It's going to have to say something. And so they got together and they got, to, got an architect. And he says, we want to build this church around the theme, Good Shepherd. Around the theme, Good Shepherd. Okay? And now we will center it around Psalm 23 and the 10th chapter of John. The Sh Good Shepherd. Chapter. Okay, and so they did. Now, do you notice anything in this design that would fit in with the theme? You don't. Okay, notice you got you got three-sided seating, haven't you? It's not straight like some churches. Three-sided. You know why? Because sheep would gather around the shepherd. 
sheep would gather around the water, and it's separate that we are gathering around the spoken word of God. We come and we're gathered around the sacraments of Holy Communion and baptism. So that was the point of having a three-sided thing, that we're gathering around this, okay? Am I making sense? You guys are faking it. You interested? Don't lie, you're in church, okay? <laughs> oh, you're really interested, aren't you? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, but anyway, that was it. Now, here's another thing. <coughs> Look at the beans. What's different about the beans? Notice how they're inverted. They call them inverted beans. They scoop up like this, from inside up. Do you see it? Yeah. Okay. Those beams were made out somewhere in the western part of the country. They could not ship these beams on rail in the United States. They had to come around through Canada because in the United States, the uh, railway coming through the tunnels in the mountains couldn't take those beams. They were too low and it would clip them off. So they had to go around Canada to get them here. One thing I want you to notice now, when you get out sometime, you look at those beams, you look at the top of that, uh, of the outside, and you'll notice as the beams come up, they're not all together. Some are shorter, some are longer. What does that tell you? What's the reason for having them shorter or longer? Uneven. What's that? Nothing's, Nothing's perfect. Okay, that's a good one. Okay, you can read a lot of things in it, but does it does it also look at it? And you look at it. Gee, those idiots didn't finish it. It looks unfinished, doesn't it? When you're out from the outside, it looks unfinished. Well. It's the message of that to us and the world is the mission of this church, the mission of God, is never, ever finished. Follow me? And that's it. It's never finished. It keeps on going and going and going. So that's basically the, the history of this church. Any questions? Any questions? So this church has grown from zero to, I don't know, what is the membership now? Anybody know? Around 4,000, right? I, I, mean, I, don't, I don't know, I don't pay attention to it, but, but it's around, around 4,000, I think. Okay, now, <clears throat> the thing I want to say is that the church is not finished. The mission's not finished. And I like what's taking place in the church today. You've heard, they've heard people talking, there's a committee that's called the Transformation Committee. You heard of that? They're meeting with people, trying to say, how can we carry on the mission of our Lord in a, in a deeper way, a better way, more efficient way of reaching people? Okay? That's what they're doing. See, we're never finished. You're never finished. As a member of this church, we expect you to be involved, to carry on this mission. Too many people have died for the Christian faith to allow it to go dead, okay? So you and your training here are being called to do exactly that, to give your life daily work and help out with the mission of the church. We depending on you. Okay? So, it's never done. It's never done. And I like to say that you kids, I'm, I'd like to encourage some of you kids to go into the ministry. <laughs> he points to you, and you, 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 your stare would have killed him. You know, who, me, I'm not going to. Hey, hey. It's, it's, it's great. 
But I'll tell you what, I don't think there's a, ever a willing volunteer to go in, into the ministry. All of us guys, when we were down at the seminary, began to talk about our, our way of how we got there. And I'll tell you what, I think there were, all of us had heel marks all the way up to the door of the seminary. You just, you know, you, you just didn't know if it was for you or what, and you, stuff like that. But listen, God is calling you in service, whether it be teaching, being a doctor, whatever. But also might be calling you to be in the ministry of the church. I think I'd like to see somebody. This is it. And you could do well. So, the way you're dressed, you'd be good for, for Alaska. You know, be a mission church up there, okay? Uh, but anyway, uh, that's, that's basically it. But it's, I, I, I ser sincerely want to say, hey, that's where I like to see. Have it. Do we, I, I honestly feel that Good Shepherd is blessed with a good pastoral staff today. Pastor Craig, Pastor Bob, Pastor Pam. I really enjoy them. I think they, they do well in their, in their ministry. They're very dedicated and they're, they're always looking to see if they can, what more they can do. And I, they're doing well. So support them. Maybe one thing you should think about. I'm going to sow the seed into you. I told you very briefly about the mission of the church, how we got started. But you know what? Bismarck has grown quite a bit, hasn't it? You go out north here, and I, I almost get lost every time I go out there. You know, there's a new street, new houses, you know. But there's no real Lutheran presence out beyond. Go to Liberty grade school, the elementary school. There's not really a church out there. I think you, we, I'm a, uh, you kids really should talk it up and ask some of the adults, why can't we get, go to the synod office and say, could you help us work with the church headquarters and see if they can help us establish a congregation somewhere in that area? It's fun. People will enjoy it and it'll be a good service. Okay? We should have more churches, smaller sizes, so we can be more dynamic. Any questions besides can we get out of here? You know, when I taught confirmation, I was an old, yeah. It was in the, in the chapel. Homemade altar, homemade pulpit, and, and drop light coat. And like I said, benches or planks sat down with on nail kegs. That was it. No, it, it was the building was enclosed, so we were inside. Okay. Now, uh, when I taught confirmation, I was a, I was really an old goat. And I made a rule. You had to take notes during class. I figured if you listened, you wrote down and read, you'd retain. And there'd be less discipline problem. I had a rule. You speak. You get out of line. I'll speak to you twice. The third time, you're out. You don't come back until your parents come with you. And we'll sit down and we'll talk. It worked. Last kid I booted out, told him he had to leave. And then his mother came and talked to me. She was my wife. So he had, so that's a fact. <laughs> so I tried not to play, I tried not to play favorites. He still reminds me of this every so often. I said, you deserve it. Okay. Anything else? Andy, I don't have anything more to say. Yeah. Give him a round of applause. Oh.